Um, I would like to say first um, that I'm very, very happy to welcome you all to Brown University on behalf of the Women Writers Project and the Center for Digital Scholarship and also the Brown University Library. And second, that FOTUS and I are very happy to welcome you all to this workshop entitled Knowledge Organization and Data Modeling in the Humanities on behalf of the Center for Digital Editions at the University of Würzburg and the Brown University entities that I just named. So um, a few words of sort of housekeeping, welcome, warm thanks, all the rest of it um, before we get going. Um, first of all, a few words of a very warm thanks are due to those who supported the workshop in many ways and whose contributions I think we're all going to be enjoying and benefiting from <laughs> over the course of the next few days. Uh, first of all, our major sponsors, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Also the Brown University Library, which is sponsoring our reception tonight. And Brown's media production services are providing the videotaping and the streaming. And thank you very much, Nick, for being with us. Um, and my colleagues, Elizabeth Piet and Gosha Rimsa-Polowska, who um, have been and are about to be a tremendous help to all of us in making this all go smoothly. So you'll see them at various points during the uh, course of the event. Uh, Gosha is there in the corner. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. Um, and of course, our greatest thanks go to all of you for actually coming all this way, in some cases, tremendous distances, um, and uh, to contribute to this workshop. So we are hoping it's going to yield a lot of um, insight and benefit um, during the course of the event itself, and also afterwards in the form of the various publications that we're going to create from this. A few little housekeeping details. First of all, the restrooms are in the back of the room, um, men's room right there in the corridor, and the ladies' room sort of hidden discreetly away in the corner. The wireless, if you haven't already found it, is the brown guest, and it will ask you for an email address, I think. Um, power, there is power. Um, please share. I don't think we have quite enough for everybody to remain hooked up to the scuba gear for the entire time, but um, I believe you guys can work that out. Um, this is, of course, a multilingual community, and so I'm going to just remind us all to be sensitive to that and uh, produce good audio quality for everybody. Um, don't let the Americans use weird idiomatic expressions that don't make sense to anybody who wasn't born in their hometown. Um, yes, well, this is actually a point that I learned from Laurent, so thank you, Laurent, and, uh, and remind us as often as necessary. <laughs> Perfect, <laughs> perfect, yes. We all have those, uh, those references in our heads. Um, the video, we are being videotaped, and the video is being streamed live, um, and don't let that um, freak you out. Um, but <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I just freaked myself out. Um, <laughs> but the point is that this is you know, a very small group, um, necessarily so because of the scope of the funding and the, the nature of the discussion, which is very much about discussion. Um, but we wanted a way to involve a virtual community. And so the live streaming is one way, and also the video is going to be archived and um, made available for future reference. So we can all see ourselves and remember what we said and remember what each other said and things like that. Um, in virtue of that, and as part of the sort of virtual participation, um, we've asked a few people in particular, um, Trevor Munoz and Carrie Krauss, to um, pay attention to the Twitter stream, which we hope will um, be uh, vibrant, and to give voice to any questions or comments that come in via that stream from remote participants. And we may also get some comments um, via email um, as well. So anyone who's following Twitter, anybody who's, um, who does that during the course of conferences should also feel free to be a surrogate voice for those who are not here. And this is experimental. We're all going to be feeling our way. So let's just, we'll use our good sense and, uh, and hopefully it will be fun. Um, and finally, because this is a workshop, uh, rather than a conference, and we're all more or less known to each other. We're not going to do elaborate, full-bore um, introductions of each speaker when they speak. Um, but if you want to find the full biography for anybody here, um, it's on the website at datasymposium.wordpress.com. So with that, I will just leave you with a few thoughts about what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, this workshop is really an attempt to think about what knowledge organization and data modeling in the humanities really means, and to consider how to bring it into greater visibility within the digital humanities and within the humanities as a whole, and to understand how our modeling approaches 
influence or shape humanities research practice. So the presentations, the panels, you know, all of this wonderful material that we're sort of bringing into evidence here um, constitutes what we have to work with. It constitutes sort of the, the material we can grapple with in considering these questions. And the discussion, I think, will have at least as much weight as those more formal interventions, and perhaps more so, because it's in the discussion that we have a chance to really step back from the specific cases and the particular projects that we're very invested in and think about what they can teach us more broadly about data modeling, how we think about data modeling, both in a specific way and also in a more sort of general and metaphorical way. So um, I urge you as discussants, as questioners, and as presenters to think about you know, what you're saying in that larger light. Um, please take a look at the questions that are included in your, in your schedule and ask those questions and others like them uh, whenever it seems useful. Um, and all of the discussion and the presentations will be synthesized um, by Fotis and me, our next mission, <laughs> um, into a final white paper, which will reflect um, really everything that's gone on here and will be published electronically along with the slides and video and so forth. So with that, I will unplug myself, and I will plug in Wendell, and I will turn it over to Wendell. This is, of course, the moment where the one thing that is difficult. Is that working? Excellent. Hi. Um, Thank you, Julia. Um, this is really an honor to be invited to uh, address all of you and the world um, virtually, the little, the little piece of the interested world that um, may be looking at this now or in the future um, on this topic. It's really, a, really a, quite a moment, I think, for us because we are uh, working on the basis of 20, 30, 50 years of successful work in the digital humanities. It wasn't always called that, of course. Um, but um, we are also beginning um, some amazing things. And uh, so I think that um, it's at that, at that moment, this is really a, a, a fabulous opportunity for all of us and for everybody, really, to be thinking about all these questions. Uh, so in, in starting that, I'd like to start by thanking everybody for being here and thanks to, uh, to Brown and to the NEH and to the, Deut uh, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft um, and to everybody who's helping us to do this work, including at our home institutions, of course. Um, because um, this work, as one of the themes I think you'll see emerging from what I have to say, is in, by nature collaborative. It is just something that we do together. Um, and that's uh, kind of interesting and kind of important when we think of uh, where the, what the humanities is and the, the sort of stereotype of the humanities uh, scholar as being a very solitary individual. Of course, it's never been the case, but it is something that has kind of come to be embedded in the culture as a sort of a notion. And it's uh, one of the questions that I think we want to be uh, keeping in mind as we go forward with this. Um, so um, basically, I have plenty of time this morning, and I'm probably or hopefully not going to be using it all because I want to open up um, the opportunity for everybody to, uh, to respond. Um, um, what I'm going to be doing is presenting a number of slides with illustrations um, and talking on the theme of the data modeling uh, in the humanities theme of, the, of, of our workshop. Um, and in the course of that, I'm going to be showing you a demo. Um, and uh, I hope the demo doesn't sort of swamp the conversation because the demo is, uh, um, you know, something that we can all be doing. And I hope that all of us will be doing that in the, in the course of the next three days as well. But I think it's also important because we need to be concrete. We need to be talking not just about these big ideas, but also we need to be talking about what we're actually doing and why that's interesting and rich and, and useful. Um, so um, I have three questions and one experiment. The experiment, of course, is where the demo comes in. Um, the three questions, uh, question number one is, what do we mean by data modeling? And I want to pose you that at the beginning because we're going to be asking it for the next three days. Um, and that's a naturally a humanistic question, right? I mean, how do we even begin to talk about what we're going to talk about until we know what it is that we're going to talk about, right? This is, a, this is as old as philosophy, this problem. Um, 
Secondly, I'm going to be asking what about markup? And this is uh, a question that's dear to me because I work in the field of, of markup technologies. Um, and I know that it's also important to many of you, but I pose it partly because I know it's not a critical question to everybody in this room. And I think one of the things that we want to be thinking about as we move forward is what is the role of markup technologies uh, within digital humanities? And I, I pose that as an honest question. That's not a rhetorical question to which I have an answer. Of course, markup technologies must be the center of digital humanities. That's not really what I mean at all. Um, on the other hand, I do find them to be essential uh, for reasons which I think that um, you know, I, I will try to communicate to you. And even for those of us to whom they are not essential, I think they're going to be, they're continue to be very, very useful and important. Uh, so I'm posing that question also as an open question. Then my last question, what about schemas, is kind of the outlier among my questions because um, it, it seems like, you know, the, you know, that's really there so I can have three, right? Well, actually not. In some ways, I think that question is, is really going to be the focus because when we start looking at my demonstration, what you'll see is that there's a point at which the demonstration kind of leaves off with a, what do we do next? And the, the, I'm going to have some things to say about schema technologies and the relationship between schema technologies and markup languages and the relationship between schema technologies and markup languages together and the larger question of data modeling. Um, so it's, it's as if each question sort of bears down into a more narrow concern, which then also reflects on the larger question. So um, um, also, uh, Julia has very kindly um, uh, volunteered to help out. Uh, sometimes when I get excited, my hands sort of fly off in different directions. And so I, I, we, we've agreed on a code word. Uh, my, the code word is Julia, I am freaking out. Um, <laughs> And if I say that, then Julia will very quietly, deftly sort of slip in and take control of the mouse, and we'll sort of take it from there. Um, all right, so um, what do we mean by data model? Uh, Julia, I'm freaking out. Um, <laughs> Um, we've got some nice pictures here, and I want to sort of do some zooming and stuff, so Julia is going to help with that. Um, and you'll remember that this little icon up here will give you that zoom capability. Um, so of course, up, what you see here on the up, up, upper right is a Lego model of the Brandenburg Gate. Um, and that is the data model. Um, the Brandenburg Gate can be con conceived of, if you like, as an artifact, an historical artifact, a text maybe. You might read the Brandenburg Gate. Um, and of course, this is a model of the Brandenburg Gate. And it's conceivable that we might learn about the Brandenburg Gate by building this model. Um, we might learn about the Brandenburg Gate itself by building this model. And we might have our curiosity about the Brandenburg Gate and what the Brandenburg Gate is and its place in history and so forth, stimulated by our interaction with this model, right? Um, so Julie, if you can uh, zoom out again. Um, one of the interesting things about this to me is that, 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 that when I were, uh, work in my field with data modeling, um, I'm not actually uh, um, um, thinking about uh, building um, models of the Brandenburg Gate. I'm thinking about enabling others to build models of the Brandenburg Gate, and other things like the Brandenburg Gate, right? And so from my point of view, the data model that we're dealing with here is actually the stuff on the lower left. Right? The, 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 the Lego system itself is providing a data model, which we can then build models out of. Right? And this is really important that I want to point out going into this, that when we talk about models, we already are confused about what we're talking about, because we're talking about several things at once. We're talking about a technology that allows us to build things, right, which gives us a model, like little, these little pieces that interlock together. Um, and uh, there's a sort of a consistent internal consistency and organization, but at the same time, a, a range of possibilities that they offer us. Um, and then at the same time, we're talking about the things that we build out of those little pieces, those building blocks. Um, and then uh, if you can zoom out again, um, this is complicated even further uh, by the fact that um, we also have rules about how these put these pieces together, for example. And you might, for example, conceive that it might be possible to have a, rules about, a set of rules about how to build uh, 18th century neoclassical monumental architecture in Lego. Right? N not the Brandenburg Gate necessarily. That might be one instance of our schematic neoclassical architecture of the 18th century, late 18th century. Or then we have a scoping problem, right? Are we going to take this all the way back to the Renaissance? Or, right? Um, we, can, we can conceive of this problem of defining what it is that we're going to model as itself a modeling problem. 
right? And so, of course, in the, in the, in the little um, uh, um, picture here um, that, that Julia has, what you have is a sort of schematic view of the, the rules for assembling a Brandenburg Gate, right? Which is when you buy the Lego set, um, you get this Brandenburg Gate that they have designed and implemented for you, and then you can build it and follow these rules. And that, that's kind of a, a you know, a, a, the, the um, of course, the schema, but in this particular case, it's the schema for the Brandenburg Gate. It's not just anything. Um, and then, uh, uh, going back to the longer view, finally, you have the, 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 the fourth outlier, which is a model of, a, a, of an artifact at a particular point in history, a particular place and time. This is the Brandenburg Gate in 1980. Five, um, and one of the things that you'll see when you consider consider this model is that in order to build this model, I had to go outside of the capabilities, the affordances of my modeling architecture because I didn't have enough Legos to build a wall, so I used alphabet blocks, and then the sign I had to like go really out there, right? And th that's just something we see too, right? So that we we, we um, in in the a general theme of data modeling in the humanities, we see this issue where we have tools and technologies that we use to build models that we then interact with and learn from, and yet at the same time, in order to actually achieve our goals of representation, uh, you know, publishing, um, uh, pedagogy, and so forth, we're also being somewhat opportunistic. There's a bricolage aspect of our work, right, where we're pulling together things that aren't even within the scope, right? Um, so. Um, Let's, uh, let's go on to the next slide. Um, now, um, in our case, of course, this problem runs head on to another really, really interesting and profound problem, which is that we work with text. Um, and now, of course, then we have the problem of defining what text is. Um, and that itself is an interesting problem that you could have a seminar on. Um, text is not re ever really just text. Text has history, text has context. Um, at the same time, text is something that we make stuff out of, right? Text is our building blocks. Text is the, 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 the stuff we use. Um, it's an encoding technology. It always has been a, an encoding technology. Um, that's one way of defining text is an encoding technology. Um, um, the uh, the cuneiform um, brick that you see there um, on the lower left, which is uh, in, the, in the British Museum, is, is sort of really interesting because it, it represents a fairly, uh, you know, quite early instance of text. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that I'm not a scholar of uh, ancient Near East by any means, but I have read enough about it to understand that even at the beginning, text and markup were deeply interconnected. And this brick has both text and markup on it. And it's hard to tell the difference between those two things. Um, it, it, one of the things that, that we might say when we talk about text is that text is markup, or you can't have markup unless you can have text. But right there's there's this sort of interesting interesting problem there. Um, and then um, also in the slide, um, um, uh, zooming back out again, um, you see this um, you see this uh, photograph of this fabulous. Um, <clears throat> edition of uh, Petronius. Um, it was an uh, early 18th century edition of Petronius, which um, this, this picture was taken on the roof of a car in a, on a mountain in uh, West Virginia, uh, Maryland, actually, um, across the river from West Virginia. Um, it, it, you know, one day I happened to be looking for an out-of-print book, and I found this guy up in the mountain who was uh, pulling books together. He sells them on the internet, and he had this in his library. And I said, you have to let me take pictures of that. Would you let me take pictures of that? Because, um, th and this is, of course, a, another beautiful illustration of, of where text takes us because um, text isn't just text here, right? And this particular edition, obviously Petronius, uh, the fragments of Petronius would not make this 600-page uh, volume by themselves. This thing is heavily annotated um, and edited. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you know, then you have text within the text and you have a lithograph which has got text on it, uh, uh, you know, the uh, picture of a monument with text on it and, um, you know, you just have layers and layers. And this is part of our problem that we are simultaneously trying to study and model something at, at the same time as we're also using that same thing that we are studying and modeling in order to achieve our goals. Um, and this especially becomes interesting in the digital realm because, of course, digital text is another thing again. 
because the computer, if nothing else, is a device for encoding and a device for translating between abstract representations lends itself very naturally and properly to text processing. In some ways, a computer is a text processor, fundamentally. Um, and so, um, in our case, we have the particularly interesting problem of, uh, of modeling with digital text. Um, so, um, let's look at the next slide. Um, I um, want to um, bring to your attention how when we talk about um, modeling, part of what we're talking about is the part of our system that we're not going to be thinking about, right? And this gets back to this business of layers. Just as experienced readers don't think about the letters of the alphabet as we read the page, we don't even necessarily think about the words, right? They're, they're in a sense almost, you know, communicating themselves directly into our minds as we read. Um, the same thing is true of, of technologies. Part of the way in which we build these things is to embed their design in such a way that we do not need to be consciously interacting with them in the way that we don't need to worry about uh, the specifications of the logo architect, Lego architecture when we use Lego, right? Um, interestingly enough, we live in a world where if you want to do that, you can. And you can go up on the internet and get this fabulous SVG diagram that shows you the specifications of LEGO architecture. I did not draw those beautiful um, um, yellow and, and, and red blocks. I just pulled that down and it's a you know 4K SVG file that I was able to drop in. And, um, a nice illustration in a sense of, of what we're talking about. Um, so that if you do want to improvise with Lego and go outside of the bounds of Lego, you can you can uh, uh, find ways of doing that. Um, but nevertheless, we have this thing where if we want to design and build something that we're actually going to be able to use, not just as individuals who are deeply invested, but as a community, we're also going to be designing and building systems that have things about them which we're going to, of which we're going to be unconscious, right? And this is you know obviously the case with us. I mean, this is trivial, right? You know, the fact that many of us can can, can map between uh, ASCII code points and Latin letters is what identifies us as geeks. Um, and um, most people do not do this and do not need to do this. Um, so let's look at the next slide. We'll, we'll get back to this problem of digital text. Um, so here you have this sort of air, very interesting idea. Um, and don't, try, don't think that this spectrum here is by any means um, formally organized. This is much more impressionistic than it looks, right? Um, but um, there is, an, in a sense, a sort of an implicit hierarchy in the way in which we actually work with text. And uh, um, in particular, I'd like to um, draw your attention to the, uh, to the line um, uh, between uh, the XML region here and the graph models region here, because that's a particular line of interest to me. Right, where what, what, what's happening is that as we move up in terms of the, um, uh, the constraints that we're willing to enforce and the costs that we're willing to bear in order to build and support an infrastructure, we're also moving up in terms of the power that we get out of a technology, right? And this particular line where we're crossed from multiple hierarchies into one hierarchy is the line where we begin to get XML because XML, of course, famously in, in its own self only represents one hierarchy at a time, right? Now, this isn't to say that you can't use XML to represent more than one hierarchy, but you'll do that by using XML's tree structure to represent things that are not trees. Right, so it, it, what, it, you, what you get is as you go up the scale, you actually get the capability of representing things that are more and more and more complex and more and more capable of being uh, optimized for processing within the computer, as well as being optimized in the sense that they're, they come pre-built and pre-packaged so that you can use them without having to develop them yourself because they're supported by standards, right? At the same time as there's a, a certain loss of expressiveness because certain commitments have already been made. Right, and th that's the, the 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 in a sense almost the fundamental dilemma of the of the text encoder is that th that we're text people. We want to be sort of on the low end of the scale here, in the sense that we want to be sort of loose and shaggy and improvising, and you know use the text to represent the world in arbitrary ways, the way we're used to doing when we you know write into a text editor or you know 
doodle on a page almost. Um, and yet at the same time, as long as we're doing just that, we don't get any of the power that we get when we go down and bear down and make those commitments into the, in, you know, into the supporting technologies that let us actually build things and use things and build applications and deploy technologies. Um, and um, of course, this is a kind of a, a fundamental trade-off. Right, um, and uh, my answer to that fundamental trade-off is to say not that we want to be at the low end or that we want to be at the high end. My answer is to say we want to be both. We want to be able to move up and down, right? We want to be able to start with just XML and then compile it into something that's not XML. In order, you know, it, 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 having made that commitment, and yet at the same time, if we're not ready to make that commitment, we want to be able to do something that's mar much more sort of freeform, improvisational, playing around, um, um, and then find out what commitments we're willing to make in order to get what power within what stack or what architecture. Um, so I'm, I'm going to come back to this, um, but um, uh, just to, um, before I move on, um, notice that it, within XML, um, um, you, you also have certain kinds of, uh, um, certain kinds of uh, choices that, that you can make in terms of the commitments. And um, um, one of the things, for example, that we've seen that's very interesting and very significant in the last uh, 10, 15 years is the, is the advent of much more general purpose text processing on, on on uh, the computer platform uh, apart from the word processing desktop publishing application, right? Uh, much more general, per and, that, and that comes largely because the development of the, of the XML platform has allowed us to go lower and get more loose and improvisational than, for example, you can do with relational databases, which are much more at the higher end, where you have to make your commitments up, up front. Um, and then, having done that, then you get the power of that uh, um, uh, of, the, of the platform's uh, capability to do operations with the with that sort of data. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so th this is where we get to what I'm interested in in sort of my hobby time. Um, imagining if we could get the benefits of markup without the early commitment to a single hierarchy that XML gives you, uh, requires of you. Um, and uh, of course, um, a number of you know that this is a, kind of a special interest of mine and uh, see me uh, present on this. Um, <clears throat> what I want to show you is uh, my latest work in this area, um, which Julia is going to get up in the, in the, in the browser here. Um, um, liminal, layered markup and annotation language is an experiment, uh, sort of a, um, uh, uh, it's a it's a technology which is uh, designed as a markup technology um, by myself and a, a couple of colleagues and cohorts in um, different parts of the world. Um, that is designed to give you uh, uh, um, um, the uh, the capability of markup, but not require that single hierarchy that XML gives you, uh, requires of you. And th so um, what we have, for example, over on the left, uh, Julie's gonna open up a liminal file. We have the very same idea uh, that XML has where you've got a text and then you've got characters in the text that are reserved as markup delimiters and then using those characters and then following a certain set of rules, you can mark your text and in particular, Liminal has two features that are very important in the context of XML, for example, um, the variances, differences from XML. Number one is this business of allowing overlap because Liminal doesn't build a tree out of the markup that it sees. Um, instead, it uses what, uh, a range model where the text is conceived of as a set of as, a, as a, a, you know, a plain text and then identifying an, um, uh, an arbitrary set of ranges over those texts, uh, that text. Um, and uh, then secondly, the second feature is that, um, that um, Liminal uh, supports arbitrary annotation. Um, um, and what we mean by arbitrary annotation at this point is that ranges can also be marked with annotations, and annotations are isomorphic structurally to documents, so annotations can be marked up and annotations can be structured in just the same way as a document can. Um, it's as if your attributes could support structure. And so, for example, in this instance, you can see that, um, that the, the, the start tag, the text start tag, ends all the way down in the line uh, before the body start tag. Uh, and all of that stuff inside of there is all inside of the 
text start tag, and it represents an annotation over the range that's been identified with that, with that start tag. Um, so, you know, for example, in this case, you can see the metadata uh, for this file, the little bit of metadata, lives very naturally and nicely within an annotation, therefore it's, it's, it's reserved out of the text in that way. And uh, of course it's interesting because that way, with, because of the way annotations work, you get a tree, it's just that the tree isn't structuring the text as a whole, the tree is merely the way in which you can elaborate the text in tree structures that then recurse um, in a tree-like way. Um, so, um, uh, Julia's going to go back um, to the main screen and then uh, jump all the way over to the right side. And um, th actually, before you do that, um, I'll just comment on what's happening here. Um, what, this, uh, what this implementation does is it actually uses XSLT, and I know that you, it drives you crazy, but it uses XSLT to parse liminal tagging. Um, and it, that's what's going on with step one, step two, step three. It's going through a pipeline where each step is taking the results of the previous step and taking it up another little notch up into a full-blown model of a liminal document. And so that X liminal that Julie is going to drill into here, um, um, you can see that uh, by this point, it's gotten to be a much, much more abstract thing. So you can see how the annotations here, for example, are nested all within that star tag. And then if you scroll down, um, you'll be able to see that you have all of these spans that represent the text itself. And the spans are then cross-indexed. Um, and if Julia goes down to the end of the file, you'll be able to see that at a certain point all of these spans end and you get ranges because the, the, these elements in the XML are representing actual ranges defined over the, the text and the identifiers on the ranges will then index into the spans and the, you know, there's a certain amount of redundancy here because this is basically a version two of this format that, that I built after a, um, earlier experiments where I decided that, it, that I would save myself a lot of work by saving some information. So there's a certain amount of redundancy that then in subsequent processing can be leveraged, taken advantage of. Um, so if, if Julia goes back, then you can see um, um, the, uh, the, um, the bubble graph over on the right um, is an SVG representation of the, the liminal document. And um, uh, Julia, if you switched applications to, um, to the Squiggle application, um, uh, th this is an SVG uh, browser. The Squiggle was a part of the Batik project, an Apache uh, SVG um, project. And it has the virtue here of being able to, um, unlike a, a, a web browser, it will let us drill in and zoom in all the way as far as we want to go. So um, Julia can like just grab a bunch of this little text here and if you um, uh, this one is actually a, a different text this is the this is a, a, a depiction of the uh, novel Frankenstein by Mary Shelley the 1831 edition and actually before we go back to the first example let me show you for the stu those of you who are students of this text and I know this is a you know one of the you know most phenomenally interesting text from so many points of view for our work. Um, that, that bubble in the middle that's marked NAR, NAR in this markup of this text is how I marked narrative, narrative structure. And one of the interesting things about this novel is of course it has nested narratives, and the nested narratives in this novel actually overlap the chapters in a really kind of bizarre way because they, it starts with letters and then chapter one starts and it's all happening inside. Chapter one starts a new narrative and then it goes along and then around uh, chapter 10 or 11, I forget which, the monster starts speaking. And that m bubble in the middle is the, is the creatures, the, the, uh, the created uh, entities, speak, uh, five chapter long narration of, of what happened to him um, and how he, um, uh, how he educated himself by reading Milton and Volney um, and, and so forth and so on. Um, and then at the, at the end, you see that bigger bubble chapter is that long last chapter where the, where the uh, victor, the doctor, Dr. Frankenstein, leaves off his narration and then you pick up again with the frame. Um, and um, the, uh, over in the bar depiction over on the left, you see these, uh, the, the, the yellow bits there, those are where quotes occur, and um, quotes occur in the narrative. And so you, you can actually begin to get a sense of the sort of overall shape and architecture of the way in which this, uh, this novel works, and you know, where you get the density of 
interaction, direct interaction between the characters and so forth. Um, and, it, you know, I mean, just think, Im imagine what we're going to be able to do when we have the capability to do this kind of very free form markup over text because the narrative structure is only the very beginning of what we're going to be able to mark once we actually have the ability to, to, to mark things without having to lock ourselves into one hierarchy and then use a lot of fancy, difficult workarounds to do all those things that don't fit into the hierarchy. Um, and we're beginning to get a taste of that with, uh, with liminal. So if you, if you just hit the, um, the, the forward button, the green arrow up there, and I, I believe that'll take us to the other one. Um, what this text is, is um, this is a, um, and you can drill in here, um, um, the, um, yeah, uh, shit, yeah, it's control. Um, yeah, so just grab a chunk of it and, um, in this case, and just to go all the way down in, um, this is a narrative poem by Percy Shelley, um, uh, Julian and Madelo. Really fascinating um, piece of work because it's a, it's a Shelley poem, and if you know Shelley, Shelley is a, um, you know high romantic. Um, but this is a, I, I think of it as a Shelley poem wrapped up inside of a Byron poem wrapped up inside of a Shelley poem because the poem is about a conversation between two characters that represent Shelley and Byron and the form of the poem is actually in many ways more Byronic than it is Shelley because it's rhymed couplets which is a form that Shelley doesn't use um, and also the, the rhythms and the cadences and the, 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 the diction is, it seems very very Byronic but um, um, the 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 um, the text that uh, that Julia grabbed is uh, right out of the middle of this poem, and if if you scroll, it, it sort of pan down. Well, actually, just just right here, you see how um, uh, over in the lower uh, right you have a pilcrow mark that occurs right there. That mark there identifies the uh, break in verse paragraphs. And what we have there is a verse paragraph break that happens in the middle of a line. Um, and then over the bubbles on the left side, you can see the, um, the, the line groups that represent the rhyme couplets. And there's this one tercet in the middle where um, thou sealst them with many a bare broad word and sears my memory o'er them, for I heard and can forget not. They were ministered one after one. You have a tercet, which is, you know, for, you know, classic English way of breaking out from the couplet structure and getting this, you know, little bit of motion and energy into the uh, in, into the text. Um, and if, if you scroll down, um, it, yeah, the shift will pan. You you can just pan that thing, yeah. Um, um, and uh, go all the way down to the bottom, um, because one of the things that um, and then actually uh, uh, um, zoom out a little bit too. Use the magnifier to. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, there you go. Um, and keep going uh, all the way. I'm going to see the end of the poem at this point. Ah, perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead and zoom out and then just readjust that. Um, the, the poem structurally has got this long, long uh, in it, in a quote. It's marked as a cue, which is a speech by a crazy, you know, madman that the two of the, these two guys go and find, you know, in a tower in Venice. And then after that story, you have these three VP verse paragraphs where suddenly the tone changes and it becomes much more, um, much more sedate. Well, sedate, no, but um, um, composed. It's like, uh, and there's that Byron sense, right, where, and in terms of the narrative also, suddenly the time jumps. It's like, you know, suddenly many years later. And you can actually see this structurally because you get these three verse paragraphs that are, each one is, a, I mean, I think two of them are 36 lines long, one is 37, or maybe there's a verse paragraph break in the, in the middle of the line again. And in any case, you can see that the poem formally becomes much more regular again at that point. And, you know, for those of us who are students of poetry and poetic form, to be able to see poems like this and to work with them in this way is just really kind of an interesting, fascinating um, way of, uh, of, of, you know, doing that classical, old-fashioned, humanistic exercise of connecting the poem's form to its theme, to its thesis. Um, and, um, um, you know, I can show you more about this, but um, to, to, let's go back to the, um, to the demonstration and, and um, just to the back button. Um, one of the things that, um, that I can do is pull XML out from Liminal, which turns out to be really useful because if you want to format the text, it's actually a lot easier to do that in a tree, out of a tree. 
um, the, um, the, not impossible to do it. And in fact, um, I think that uh, you know, there's no particular reason why we can't have technologies that do it very fluidly and flexibly and powerfully over a range model, uh, do formatting on a range model. But um, the technologies that we have and that I know how to use are, are, are XML-based. Um, um, by the way, I should say in passing that, y you know, uh, uh, although, you know, what you see I think is, um, is pretty cool, I am not a programmer. Uh, this is done by somebody who's kind of figuring it out as he goes along. And I hope and expect that people who are serious computer scientists and serious programmers are going to lo start looking at the problems that I'm just beyond my depth in dealing with and looking at how are we going to actually do this kind of work uh, you know in a much more sustainable way where it's not you know just improvising you know what i'm doing is i'm working within the xml space and then forcing myself down that slope out into something that isn't really XML at all, and then pulling myself back up again so that I can kind of be comfortable, right? Because that's where I'm really comfortable. Um, so um, let's uh, let's go back to the slides, and I'll uh, try to pull out from this back to our general themes. Um, so I think the answer to this question, can we conceive a, mi a viable market uh, regime? Um, it, the answer is, well, absolutely yes, we can conceive of it. Now, can we actually build it so that it really works? Well, that's still a question mark. I mean, I think you can see some tantalizing suggestions that, that, that such a thing is possible. And I also think it's important to keep in mind that this is not an either or thing, right? I mean, if this works, this is going to work because it works along with and complements the technologies that we already have. Um, and we need to be able to be in that XML space to take advantage of the power of uh, uh, the single hierarchy, and uh, even while we um, trying to deal with problems that don't lend themselves to that approach. So um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so um, there's a particularly interesting um, uh, problem that you begin to deal with when you think about um, processing ranges, and that is that um, ranges are really, really good for some things and really um, expensive in other ways. And this is the stuff which I'm going to need the computer scientist to help me with. Um, oh, uh, the, the, the middle graph here is um, uh, what you might think of as, it, it's, it's, it's a tree structure, but it's not um, a, uh, it's not, a, you can't do this, this tree structure in XML, um, because as you can see, uh, and this, this uh, text here is uh, the opening uh, quatrain of a, um, a Rilke sonnet. Um, you see that, um, that where you have overlap, where, for example, you have um, a, a sentence that begins in one line and ends in the next, um, you have this kind of interesting breakage or confusion in the way in which the structure represents itself. And if you zoom back out again, um, y y you can see in the marked up version of the text how you could get from the markup into this kind of tree, just reading the markup in what I think was a naive way, where every start tag, you know, identifies a node, and then your inheritance, your you know, relationship, the dominance relations within the graph are inferred by the relations between the tags. Um, and I think this is interesting because, you know, of course, we've talked for a number of years in talking about the overlap problem in XML about graph structures and, um, in particular, the, the, the Godog structure um, that, um, that Michael and Klaus Wiedfeld and a few others have worked on um, is, is in the space is to try to deal, to try to, um, to um, architect uh, something that gives us the power of graphs um, um, and yet also uh, provides for overlap. And the, the thing is that the, the, the problem as I see it is that, that the tree that, that Julia just showed you is not actually the right tree. The right tree is the one on the lower right, where in fact, of course, this is only part of the tree because there are going to be further up structures that these guys hang off of. But the, the, quatrain, the quatrain is neither a child nor a parent of a sentence, even if a sentence contains quatrains. You don't have a child-parent relationship between a quatrain and a sentence. Sentences and phrases occupy an entirely different hierarchic domain from quatrains and lines. Um, and the, the interesting aspect of this problem to me is how do we get from here to there, right? How do we get from the flat ranges into something which actually represents intellectually the abstraction that we conceive of when we want to design a text that we can work with and you know, actually build optimal processes for query um, 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 formatting and what have you. Um, 
and so this is a research area, and I am, you know, by no means qualified to conduct this. So um, I'm going to need help. Um, so, um, and uh, um, yet, at the same time, I think that we also do know some of the features and some of the answers to this. And so if we go to the next slide, um, this is where you get schemas, right? I mean, what is a schema? And in working with schemas in the context of XML, we've learned a lot about how useful schemas actually are for all kinds of different things. Um, and in fact, it's sort of interesting how you can reflect on these, you know, and if you can think of another application or area of schemas besides these three that I've listed here, um, by all means, buttonhole me and tell me about it because, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to comprehend this problem. Um, but schemas do validation in the sense that we apply a schema to a text and then we get an answer as to whether the text conforms to the schema. And this is very, very important if we're working within uh, an architecture where we need predictability, right? So that we have a, a, you know, a criterion, a set of rules that we can then apply and then we know that our document conforms to that. Um, and of course, that's the way in which we ordinarily present schemas, that they are a way of giving us uh, you know, error messages. But that is actually a kind of a transformation because the document is actually being transformed by virtue of the application of these rules into a set of reports about the state of this document, the relationship of this document to the set of abstract rules, right? And um, then, of course, the second uh, uh, is annotation and enhancement, which relates very closely to the first, because one of our sets of annotations might be reports on which rules uh, have been followed or violated. Um, and um, in the XML space, we see this very interesting um, blurring in application between these two, um, um, these two uh, uh, uses of schemas because schemas are also used to do data type annotation of documents so that if we have a schema, we can say that, well, you know, that uh, 100 over there, that's a number. And compile it into a number. Make it, you know, re make, you know do, make it a double. But this one zero zero over here, that just happens to be a random string. That one, you, you, know, you don't make a number out of that, right? That's an, it, typically information that's not held in the document itself. We use a schema to give us that bit of information. And the amended document is, in a sense, a transformation result. Um, so uh, in, in the XML space, we call that the post-validation, uh, post-schema validation info set, um, which is the information set about the document after it's been through a validation process. Um, and then finally, the third one is that we use schemas to configure our tools, right? We, we you know, drop the schema into your editor and then your editor knows which tags are valid at any given point and so forth. Um, and all of those three applications are applications that bear directly on this problem of getting from the naive structure to the true or correct or optimal structure. Um, because in principle, it seems to me, and you know, I say in principle because I don't know the details, right? I just imagine that it's going to be through, that, that there's a role to be played here, not by document instances per se, but rather by ancillary information that is aggregated with those documents and presented with those documents in order to make those documents uh, richer, more capable um, in, in, in our systems. Um, and then finally, um, on this slide, I want to stress how important XML is to this, not because we're going to be using it for everything, but because it gives us a platform on which to work. Um, and I have this nice picture I got off the internet of the International Space Station. Of course, a very expensive project. Well, why do we build a space station? Well, we build a station because we learn, we build a space station because we learn about space stations. And we learn about the world. And we learn about space travel. I mean, we learn what we're going to know when we go from that space station out into things that we can't reach with a space station orbiting the Earth. Um, and, you know, I see the, the technologies they're working with as having a very similar kind of relationship where, you know, the, um, you know, you might have the guy who works in the space station saying, why would anybody want to go to the moon? Well, I don't think they actually do. Um, but, um, um, you know, that, 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 that's, that's kind of what I think of when I, when I um, hear an XML market person say, why would anybody ever want to do overlap? Um, it's like, well, I don't know, but there are people who do for whatever reason. Um, and, of course, they go together, right? I mean, um, XML gives us a fantastic um, um, platform. Um, as well as being something that's worthwhile doing in itself because we can study the earth with it. Um, so, um, yeah, next slide. Um, so this, uh, um, 
is a, um, a flowchart diagram a number of you have seen, um, but it's amended somewhat because I, what I did was basically what I'm um, imagining here is a transition from the, the, the current architecture of document processing technologies and specifically markup technologies, which is really oriented towards the, what we call lights out publishing, right? I mean, um, oriented towards the seamless and friction-free production of documents within a processing environment to, you know, to create certain kinds of outputs, probably formatted outputs. Um, and the whole idea there is the role of schema there is to uh, th provide that enforcement mechanism, that filter, so that you know what's fit to process through the system. And if it isn't, then you kick it back and you fix it, right? Whereas in the architecture that I think we really uh, need within the humanities um, is uh, um, significantly more complex, um, for one thing, which means that it's going to be harder to build and maintain. Um, but it's not really focused on that final product as its, its output. It's almost like that final product there, the result that you get in the lower, lower right there, is a side effect of the system in the same way as the output of a program is the side effect of the program. That really what we've got is the system is there because it's an opportunity for us to learn about what we're studying. Um, and in, in, with respect to that, schemas and specifications are not a set of external rules that we apply simply to know whether something is good and bad, but themselves something that we're building and developing. And I think all of us who have worked with markup in the humanities environment know this very well, right? That this is, you know, I mean, Trevor has put it very nicely when he says that every TI project is a TI customization project. Um, and, um, it, you know, it's um, not always represented that way, and yet the people who, um, you know, who, who ha capture the spirit of the TEI is something which is at the same time, um, you know, a, a, a shared community-based platform at the, as also a basis for research know that, that that's kind of the idea, is that we use it not just to do things the same way as everybody else, but to do things in different and interesting and new ways that actually apply to our research problem. Um, so uh, within the, the flowchart on the right, you have all kinds of opportunities for asking questions and for re-engineering things. And the analysis process is really the, 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 the goal um, as well as being the means of, uh, of um, achieving our our goals. Um, so uh, let's uh, go on um, to the next slide. Um, the final question I want to leave you with, which is stems from the others and which comes back to the question of data modeling, is about what role we should be playing as humanities scholars in this. And this, again, is a question I don't have the answer to. The answer, do, do scholars get their hands dirty, is, well, yeah. But on the other hand, well, no. Right? I mean, right? Scholars are people who work with people who get their hands dirty, but they get their hands dirty while they're working with the guys who are getting their hands dirty. And um, th that, that's the way it's always been. Um, and uh, um, I think this is really important to us as we move forward in the next three days, because when we're talking about data modeling, we want to keep in mind that we don't necessarily, number one, even mean the same thing by data modeling, right? And so as I, um, you know, as I finish up here, what I want to remind you is that you know, I'm sort of putting forward these ideas and these issues, um, but I don't expect that you're going to necessarily agree with me. On the contrary, I'd be kind of disappointed if you did. Um, uh, um, but I'm only gonna, I'm not gonna know until you ask your question whether you're asking your question because I got it wrong or because you didn't know what I was trying to say. Right? I mean, you, you, um, you, you might have your own idea of what I was trying to say, and you might be right. Um, and it, I need to be corrected, but not about what I was saying, but what I thought I was saying when I said it. Um, and I hope that we're going to be doing three days of this, because this is the tradition. And um, we need to be asking each other and assuming that, you know, this person is a person who wants to get his hands dirty, but he's working for somebody who doesn't want to get his hands dirty. And they, he, you know, the, she has a right to work without getting her hands dirty in that particular thing, because she, she has other things that, that she's thinking about. And part of what we're doing as builders, of, of workers in this, in this uh, in this uh, domain is working with people who have other priorities for learning and doing and uh, you know to what extent and where they're going to get their hands dirty and we should do that without prejudging about the you know the right way to approach it um, because we really benefit from um, from the differences in our approaches that way um, so uh, with that I will uh, go to the last slide and um, um, please invite you to uh, to uh, 
respond. from Joe Matazovac asking, uh, why don't you do that? Why don't you do that in, in stand-up? And I tried to, <coughs> in, in the last half an hour, I just put that together. So I, I'm, I'm organizing your thought. So I'm trying to tell you what you should be thinking about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, taking the, the, the metaphor of, 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 of Frankenstein, basically what you do with LMN, and LMN, I knew I would not manage to pronounce that. Is you can say LMN. It's a chimera in the sense that, I mean, you're, you're, you're playing Frankenstein with Marker, trying to merge bits and pieces in one single flat structure on the screen, which is a chimera in a way. Mm -hmm. And this question about stand-up made, made me think, well, data modeling is also like you did for the Vandenburger tour, organizing right. bits and pieces which have their own autonomy. And stand-up is about identifying what we could call, I mean, what I call sometimes crystals and things which mm -hmm. you don't want to put together. This mm -hmm. is exactly what you said about sentences and portraying, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And this makes sense also for scholars because mm -hmm. they, they've got workflows through which mm -hmm. they think about the text in a certain way and then think about another way. Yes. And you don't want to force them That's to right. think all those ways together, Absolutely. even if the technology allows you to do so. Right. Absolutely. So you have a design problem there as well. Um, and design. a design problem there as well. And what I what I got up here is the is the ex liminal, which is the for, which is the form that this is uh, levitated, right? That's stepped into. If this is not standoff, I mean, the answer to Tomas's question is I am using standoff. It's just that it's not my initial representation, right? I mean, I don't see it standoff as being one way to do it, and then versus other ways to do it. Um, on the contrary, I think that it, what, we, what we need is a system that allows us, uh, you know, just as you're saying, different ways of approaching the representation of our models, even at the same time as it allows more flexibility in the modeling itself, right? And so, by all means, if standoff is the best and most efficient way for you to manage your, uh, uh, your data set with all of its complexities, do that. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to say that that's an, in a, you know, that that's an inappropriate or wrong way to do it. Um, th and, um, you know, in stressing that point, I'd like to point out how these, these ranges index into the text using standoff, right? I mean, that is a standoff representation. And it just happens that in this particular case, it's internal to the system because my demonstration is not a demonstration of standoff as such. My demonstration is a demonstration of how to parse a markup syntax into something that you can then work with in these ways. So I don't really see that as being uh, um, um, at all a, uh, an opposition. Um, and um, the other thing that I should stress in that context is that when we design liminal, we set out very, very specifically to conceive of the design of liminal itself as an abstract data model irrespective of the syntax. And what that means is that, that you can have, a, a, you can use standoff and pull it into the liminal model. You can compile, if you like. You can use this, this uh, what we call saw teeth, right, notation, uh, compile that into liminal. You can use XML. And in fact, one of the things on my to-do to list is to refine the little XML tag set that you could drop into arbitrary XML so that any XML can be parsed into liminal. Um, and, you know, as some of you know, I've done experiments on that basis in the past, and they work just as, you know, do a very, do, to do very similar things to this. Um, uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, a number of you, saw the earlier version of this, uh, of this version of the, um, of, the, uh, of the experiment, which is um, doing sonnets in English. And um, there, um, you know, what you have here is the sentence phrase business, for example, with the Rilke poem. Um, and so as you mouse over, you can see that the, uh, the range um, indicators pop up. And then if you mouse over the bars there, you can see that the particular range is highlighted. Um, and this dramatizes, and you can really see when you line these up, the difference between different sonnets and the way they, uh, the way, the way they work. And the earlier version of this was using XML source. 
So, uh, you know, I don't really, uh, um, I, I know that uh, liminal syntax isn't going to be the only way to do it. In fact, I suspect that uh, as things get, uh, get more complicated, it's going to get really, really hard to use because the nesting of annotations gets to be really confusing to read. And so we're going to need tools as we have with XML. Um, if we're going to use that syntax, you know, in a, um, in a bigger scale, and similarly, we're going to be using we're going to be using standoff notation. We need tools as in Lisp. Uh, as in Lisp, yeah. Well, we already have Lisp. We need people to write the Lisp. Yeah. Well, let's take this off because. Um, yes. Yeah, the liminal syntax. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, it seems to me that, I, I guess what I wonder is, is that are all of those stages of representation one day along? Or are you... Well, they're all XML. There, well, and, 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 they're, and in a sense, they're all intellectually isomorphic. But mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether the liminal representation and the, um, the XML version that you showed us, are we to think of those as being essentially representation of different versions of the same data model, or are they different models? Does that make sense? Uh, I think that goes to my question about what the heck do we mean by a data model. Yeah, exactly. I'm hoping it does. And I, yes. I guess maybe, maybe this is a question to think about in a, in a sort of more longitudinal way that I wanted to put it on the table. Like, at right. what point are we, when we cheat, when we manipulate a model, do we get a different model? And to what extent can we just think of models as being all the potential for what they well, and the way we work with models is with models of our models. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, I want to go back to what you say about schemas. Mm -hmm. And I do think that schema are much more than what you say. It's not just a tool for validation or something like a workbench for building tools uh, or data set. But when I do teach in particular, I do remember, I say always to my students, that it is a model. Mm -hmm. The schema is a way for making the model you had in sort of formalism, mm -hmm. people for, for the computer to understand mm -hmm. the idea you have about the text or mm -hmm. the series of text. Mm -hmm. It's a bit different with respect to the encoded text itself mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it is the instance of that model. Mm -hmm. But actually, to me, the schema mm -hmm. represents the model much mm -hmm. better than mm -hmm. the text encoded, the encoded text mm -hmm. itself. So for me, the schema is perhaps a part of it because it's the way you, you read, you see it in a formal way. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a number of fair points. It's not just one fair point. You've said some very important things about schemas. And I, in, in my discussion about schemas in the later part, I was really stressing the application of schemas within a processing system. But I also agree with you that schemas are in themselves artifacts of interest and uh, opportunities, not just for modeling, but for exercising our design sensibilities over the system as a whole, right? I mean, um, what, and um, you know, one of the things I just, you know, that pops into my head that I should mention that um, 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 when we were talking about some of the stuff over beer last night, the question of aesthetics came up. And I don't want to let that completely drop even though I can't really discuss it at any length, but I think that the, the, the question of um, aesthetics as offering us at least implicitly and sometimes more than implicitly um, uh, a set of principles and design criteria is really important. And I think it relates to the thing about schemas because um, th the application of schemas and the role of schemas within the system is exactly on that, um, that fulcrum between um, um, looking at a, at a particular instance representing something in the world versus abstracting from that and looking at it as something which is more general and um, a member of a family and a member of a, a, a demonstration of an idea. Right, and in, in in that sense, I think uh, you know schemas are really really critical. Even though I know plenty of people who would disagree with you that schemas are really the correct place to do your modeling, um, uh, um, but uh, you know I, I I think that you know in sort of my 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 Lego analogy, um, um, it, it, you know you can sit down with your Lego pile of Legos and just sort of you know put them together, but you can also design something, right? And that's what we're talking about when we start to start talking about schemas. So I couldn't agree more, really. Um, Sid. Not only couldn't agree more, I also even want to take that a step further and say to, to some of our 
smaller brains, this, the schema is so much part of our data modeling methodology that we, you know, some of us, are going to have trouble thinking about data models in the world of non, the non-true world, outside mm -hmm. of XML world. Yeah, that's probably so true, but, the, but I also want to stress that you build your schema out of something. And I think that we also want to think about the design of the Legos themselves. Oh, absolutely. Right? Um, you know, and I, it, all this having been said, I also hope and stre want to stress that I hope there are people in this room who don't agree that schemas occupy the central place and who will let their voices be heard over the next three days. Because, I, I, I you know, we, we have some of us who agree, but hopefully but, we're going to be thinking about it. When, we, when those of us are, who have boxed ourselves into this scheme is my modeling capability, when we have constraint languages for whatever it might be, lino, methodic structures, x concur, whatever you're using, our modeling capabilities are going to take a big jump. Yeah, I hope so. Desmond, were you going to? Uh, I just actually had a question about the report. Sorry, you probably can't hear me up there. Uh, you mentioned, did I understand correctly, you were talking about recursive annotation. Uh -huh. But you didn't justify it. I'd like to know why you want that. I didn't justify it? You didn't say why. You didn't say why. Or I, I missed it. But you didn't say oh, why, why we have them? Why do you want to make the annotations recursive? Um, yeah, um, uh, aesthetics. We thought it was neat. We thought it was neat. We liked the idea. Um, That's complicated. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a, you know, I mean, it's sort of a flip answer in some ways, but it, in uh, um, the more serious answer is that um, that those of us who were, you know, and at the very beginning, this is Jenny Tennyson and me looking and just looking at it at, at the point from the point of view of what do what do people we work with clients and colleagues and people we work with want to do with XML where we feel particularly strong stresses against XML things that XML can't really do. And one of those is the way that a, that a, attributes in XML are just simply strong strings, and if you want to provide attributes with any kind of internal semantics, you need to do that on your own. And to a certain extent, data typing is capable of alleviating that problem, but it involves commitments of its own. And we thought that given the idea that we have arbitrary, um, um, the capability of identifying arbitrary ranges, that one of the things that people are going to be wanting to do is make assertions about those ranges that we can't actually predict or want to constrain going in. And so this idea that, an, that uh, uh, the analog to an attribute in liminal, and namely an annotation, would, would be structured seemed very attractive to us. And it also seemed like a relatively straightforward thing to do if we were general, you know, developing a sort of generalized range model to allow that model to apply not just to the document as a whole, but to the annotations. And we think, I mean, I, I do think that if, if, uh, if the idea of liminal um, it, it gets um, um, any application, it might be in exactly those areas where it's actually difficult to define the boundaries of your document because the, 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 the document exists in some sort of nebulous form and the aggregation is happening on the fly. And in that co operational context, the ability to have an annotation be a fully structured document, which may or may not have its own markup or structure, it could also be just completely flat string, that's fine too. But the uh, capability of being able to let any document be in effect an annotation of any other document could really be useful. Um, so uh, th you know, that was sort of our thinking on that. Mm. Chris. Is that good? You got me thoroughly confused. Is that, um, that's good. And that's good um, because I'm still I'm still stuck by your initial uh, dealing with your initial question. What do we mean by data model? Uh, do we mean modeling something by using data? Mm -hmm. If that is the case, then this is redundant because show me a model that does not use data. Mm -hmm. um, so. Either it's a nonsensical expression or it must mean something else. Well, maybe we're modeling data. Okay. If the latter I mean, is the case, I, think we're, I think the answer is both. But If the latter is the case, then this leads me to perhaps there's a need to distinguish between two types of modeling. Representational modeling, which mm -hmm. serves certain pragmatic purposes, um, and heuristic modeling, mm -hmm. which serves uh, knowledge Acquiring knowledge about that which we 
model. And of course, we can do that in terms of the model model and mm -hmm. so forth. And, and I think that's where the question of dependency on and force and power of schema comes into play, where you have to distinguish again. I think there's a strong case for, for schemas in representational modeling. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I'm not sure whether there's a strong case for schemas in heuristic modeling, mm -hmm. because you're actually trying to find something new. Now, if mm -hmm. it's all in the schema already, yeah. then you're not going to find anything new. Mm -hmm. So the more constraints you have uh, defined through your schema, the less powerful the heuristic capability of your model is going to be. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're into representational modeling, of course, you're well served by very stringent schema types, um, mm -hmm. which is the trick, very powerful. Mm -hmm. That's where you need them. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's so simple. Well, I mean, I, I, I would generally agree, and I would point back to my two flowcharts as a, a, a way of sort of getting our heads around that particular kind of stress. Because I, I, you know, I, I think that that's a, a good way of characterizing two very important aspects of modeling, why we do it, what it's for, without necessarily trying to be absolutely comprehensive about it. That's a very good place to start. At the same time as we do heuristic modeling by way of representational modeling and the other way around. So it's not like the two are completely discrete either. And so, you know, this is why in my, you know, my, the second flowchart, the schema itself is a site of contention. The schema itself needs to be amended and uh, extended over time because you, 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 the, the schema needs to be subjected to the scrutiny of is this adequate and not just adequate to my representational task, but does this, does this capture the information that I, that I, that I want to capture? Um, um, and so at that point, the, the, um, you know, the schema gets to be the result the exercise. It's not an input anymore, right? It's, it's an output um, because it's, in effect, the codification of the heuristic process. Um, and so, um, you know, I mean, I think that, that speaks to Elena's point also um, because um, um, the, uh, the, um, we're going to, you know, I don't think Sid has anything to worry about. I think we're going to continue to worry about schemas plenty, even at the same time as I also want to put it on the table that, that for many people w working with this problem of data modeling in the humanities, schemas are sort of a niche topic because they're, at least up to this point, they've been within the context of markup language applications. And we also want to be thinking about the kinds of modeling that we have not been able to do up to this point with markup technologies. Uh -huh. okay. um, I would like to go back to the question of SID and to make a statement of what the users don't have to think about and what they're not supposed to think about. I guess that's what data models are. So uh, one thing is which we can prevent is every user thinks about a data model, even if it's basically not consciously, mm -hmm. but everybody has an idea about something. To talk about anything, we need a shared goal right? Because if I have to explain what an elephant is, I cannot uh, describe a paint that. Right? So the, the question is, um, if right here we are all specialists, we all have some ideas, probably some very strong ones, some of the words, develop the own case um, um, about how data models can work. And people have different paradigms. Some people do graph databases, some people do some other, some people do relational data. And you can use all these tools, right? Just like in science, you can use MATLAB, Mathematica, Python, Fortran, or whatever, and you can probably achieve your goal. Sometimes this is better, sometimes something else is better. But the question is how to translate that, and the problem is, is how can you evaluate if it's actually good or bad? Mm -hmm. Because uh, that's, I think, the key problem. If we are going into this kind of heuristic data model, where we apply the data model to some data, what actually comes out is not an application of the data model. It's basically a structure in the data which might actually be not fitting to the data. But as long as we don't measure this, mm -hmm. we don't know if it fits. And I think that's the situation we are in now. For like 30 years, we actually discussed about how should an ISO standard for this and that, how should, a, how should be the core of this and that, how should this and that. Be? And now, pro projects are running for 10 to 20 years today. Right? have collected data. And nobody ever checked if what's the distribution of, say, the link types in the CDOC CRM? How many of them exist, actually? Do we really need to spend 10 years of discussion on P whatever? Like, something like that. 
Yeah, right. I mean, uh, um, um, I like to pick up the, with this with you more, um, you know, after and between, because um, um, you're talking about a lot of, you know, you're echoing con complaints or concerns or uh, issues that that. Mm -hmm. um, th yet at the same time, and this is where I'm sort of split. Because you know, if if we don't argue about uh, you know how to define a P, then who will? Um, you know, I mean, you know, reminds me of you know the sort of long path I took to get to this point. And you know, I was got home from college and um, in my sophomore year, and I decided to major in classics. And my dad was trying to oh, a couple of days, you know. And then finally, one day, he showed up and he said, "Well, I suppose somebody has to know Greek." Um, <laughs> And, you know, I mean, bless his heart, um, because, you know, he had enough faith in me. And um, the, um, the thing is that um, it, it comes back to this thing about the process and the goal, right? Where I, I agree, I couldn't agree with you more about our, um, our need to um, be somewhat more careful and self-conscious of our resource allocation with respect to the energy and the time that we put into refining these things, and yet at the same time, I think that this is how we learn, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I have this issue much more in the instance than I do in general, right? I have no problem with the schema that allows us to argue all night about how to define a P. Um, it's the particular conversation about the P that I'm tired of. Um, so, Gregor, did you have a hand up? Uh, somebody? Oh, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I hope we hear more about that because it's something that I, um, because I, I need more education in, in, in REF and in semantic technologies. I know I've needed it for years and I still need it. Um, uh, um, I, I, I do think that the, that the same issues are liable to come up in terms of early commitments to certain, you know, certain semantic commitments that then constrain you further down. So, I you know I, I take your point, and I'm also going to be interested to hear and uh, you know to push back. Mm -hmm. I ask uh, everyone who asks questions to speak up um, to make sure that the questions are audible to the, uh, to the audio pickup. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, somehow related, I think, to what Elena said. I would like to come back to this idea of, of scholars getting their hands dirty. I think that whatever we speak about, even the word schema is already too much oriented, but I mean, we all share, somehow we are spoiled by schemas here. Um, and I'm also relating this issue with what you said about a TI project is a TI customization project. If you abstract away from this, and we experienced while discussing together in the <coughs> yesterday that we were doing exactly the same thing in our classes, the first thing you get students with no technical background, so have never heard about XML schemas and so on, is really to give them like a scan of a dictionary entry and say, what is it about? And data modeling is basically picking things and abstracting away. That is, study this entry as if it was a generic one, just anticipating on the problems you will see. And abstracting away is exactly what you were talking about, the data modeling process. And so there's no project, no digital humanities project without a prior data modeling activity. There is no digital humanities project without the need to write down encoding guidelines, whatever encoding scheme you use. Uh, it does not make sense to say, oh, I'm using the TI. Okay. What kind of data do you have? What is the specificity of your data? You need to write down exactly what you need when you've got a P. So everyone has to define what P is for his own project. Or parallel project, sorry. 
I hope that people um, uh, will argue with you this week. Yeah. <laughs> I strongly disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, what's missing, so actually, uh, I happened to, to that kind of conference recently where one of the key sentences I took home was somebody said, Data, digital humanities projects are not only about collecting data, but also about building tools. Which is amazing because it does not include any project which actually looks at the data, right? We just build tools for somebody else to look at the data. And actually, I think you could do a myriad of digital humanities projects without defining your own data model, just looking at the data models and the data other people have. Just look at, like, how, what's the structure of the Bible and how the text is distributed. How are the names distributed? Stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And um, how are different, say, take about 100 uh, Bible projects where people mark up the Bible with, with, with TI, with some version of the TI, and compare them. You don't need your own data model. You can actually compare all of them. And my hunch is that we would actually learn way more about uh, what's going on uh, in the understanding or in the, in the interpretation of the Bible than by taking another Bible, taking another TI, a TI data model, and do the markup of steps. Oh, which, and so you definitely agree with me. Yeah. But you said you said you need a model beforehand, right? But the model is uh, not no, necessarily no, no. I said you own. need you need to put the data modeling activity at the core of your activity, so not beforehand. I mean, it is as soon as you start, like you do. I mean, I take your example. You take ten projects working on Bible with ten encodings. The first thing you need to do, you should forget about tools. You should forget about technology. You should look at the models which are there and compare them. So oh, they, they went deep into the data there, less deeper, organized, several structure. They consider so Laura, I, think, I, I think we agree with what you say you said. Um. <laughs> you mean what I meant when yes, I yes, said Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I think we, we have three levels of data modeling. We have one level which would be that the complete text and an application of map on in the text. Then we have the schema, and I'm not sure that um, and I um, understood you, what you said, not what you meant, but what you said, um, implying that the second level is the main level of data modeling. Um, but I think it's just the second level to have a schema describing a class of object. And then we have a third level, and this in our case, this would be, a tech, for example, a text encoded in TI, TI, and then we have XML uh, as a meta, meta model. And, and, and you are talking about the shortcomings of this meta, meta model in a way, and, um, and I'm interested really why we jump so quickly at the moment from the whole area of all the three levels to this one question of multiple hierarchies. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that's because you have a personal history there, or is this the main problem you're working on? Uh, well, I think that both, the answer is both, right? I mean, I think one reason is that I was given this opportunity, and this is something that I'm thinking about, right? But, but the other thing is that I think historically, you know, I mean, Michael, 20 years ago, was writing about how texts have multiple hierarchies. We need a data model that supports hierarchies. At the time, that was radical because everything was all flat, and there were no hierarchies at all. And so, you know, developments were, you know, made on the basis that, you know, in fact, Michael had a point, and Alan and Rainier and others have a point that that hierarchy is part of the picture that we need to be looking at, right? Um, so, um, uh, of course, at the time, um, SGML, um, there was an expectation and a hope that SGML itself would um, would um, uh, address this issue better than it eventually managed to do. Um, what happened was that, in a sense, the development of SGML was hijacked by the fact that the genie got out of the bottle and the world got XML, and XML has now grown into this fabulous set of technologies that's extremely useful for most, or many most, I mean, we can argue about, you know, the applications for which it was designed, including primarily that publishing application, which is not concerned with the heuristic aspect of, of, uh, of modeling. Um, and here we are in the humanities asking the same questions that we were 20 years ago. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, it's by no means, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't personally know that we need to have an answer to the question of is multiple hierarchies or arbitrary overlap, which of course multiple hierarchies are only a subset of the overlap problem, right? Um, is that the core problem? I mean, I don't know, but I think it's a problem that's worth working on because we know that texts have multiple hierarchies and we want to represent them. 
and we want to represent them more gracefully than we currently can um, using the technologies that we download off the internet. Um, and that's not to say that uh, an extremely creative person who has a, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, or maybe just obsessed in my case, but, um, you know, uh, an interest in, in tackling with this can't think about it and work on it in the, using the current toolkit. But we want it to be as easy to think about this as we want it to be easy as it is to mark up just a simple document in HTML and put it on the internet. Um, that's when the which is basically um, that there's a, a split between those who want overlap represented directly as you're describing and others who find who are uncomfortable with that and feel that there's a strength of that the schema is a powerful thing. These two things can coexist quite happily. All you need is a, an efficient way of, of translating one into the other and back again, realizing that if you've got overlap as your core representation, you may well have some data loss when you move into a strict hierarchical form. You can move from one to the other with zero data loss mm -hmm. into the representation. Yeah, that's, and that, I mean, that's exactly what I what I try and get at when I'm talking about moving up and down the scale. And um, you know, in some cases, it's not even data loss; it's simply loss of efficiency. Um, the, the representation is simply a clumsy representation. So, but I think there, so there's going to be a lot of interesting work in this area. So I had this horrifying realization watching the uh, looking at liminal started to occur to me that, that the data modeling problem of overlapping hierarchies, which you know, I'm not sure it is the central problem, but, but uh, that, that problem, one of the problems is that that problem is written all the way down the computational stack. Oh. You know, when you, you had like what looked to me like four lines with BNF grammar for liminal. And so I'm looking at that and thinking, well, gee, what would it be like to write a BNF grammar for liminal? And I thought, well, it would be hell on wheels because the <laughs> because you know BNF grammars don't deal with this any better than you see what I mean. And you know, what does a programming language want when it gets to parsing this thing? Well, it wants an abstract syntax. Right, that's why we use a range model. It doesn't want a, it doesn't want a, a, a DAG. It wants an AST. You mm -hmm. know, that, that in a sense that we keep kicking down this road, which is perhaps just a repeat. You know, yes. say that say that we're always we're always going to be talking about. Um, Taking, taking some structure into some simpler structure down the stack, and it, and it may be that, that, uh, that then the question ultimately is, is how much do you want to be able to model in a single appliance? Uh -huh. You know, uh, Sid mentioned LISP. Well, LISP wants ASPs. LISP <laughs> wants single hierarchy tree, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a big, also the topic of the but there is something that you said before and uh, I can't, I can't not say that. Um, <laughs> you said something about when you read the text, when you read the text of page, you don't consider the letters, you don't look at the letters. Oh, I'd say most people, most, most of the time. Okay, good, because that's mm -hmm. what the point is. Um, depends where you're going to read. Yes. Depends who you are. That's right. We actually, one of the fun bits of the humanities that we look at everything. That's right. In, in different points of view, different moments, a different aspect, but there is always someone that we look at that. But you think, well, it's not really right. Absolutely. Right? Always. Right. Yeah. So you cannot really have any layer that you can say, you know what? That's fine. Right. Yeah. Well, having made many categorical Fortunate. statements <laughs> this morning, I'm appealing to all of you to not take anything that I said as being intended as categorical. Um, it, 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 and, and, you know, there are people who engineer their own Lego sets. Um, and by all means, and that's one of the best things about the humanities, um, is that we have license to do this. Is there built into it um, an interpretive loss 
So for example, you have a very handy, these are the narrative circles that are embedded you know, mm -hmm. within this text. And I don't know that I would intuitively know that by looking at that output without your thoughts. So is that something that's built into this process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um, it isn't all built for the bubbles. I mean, the bubbles are much the fun part. You know, it's purple because I thought that looked good. Um, and because then I tried white and Kim, my wife, you know, clearly I like the purple better. Um, you know, I did mention the word aesthetics a minute ago, and I think that's actually really important here. Um, um, I, um, uh, um, I think that the larger question of the sort of the design of the interface and so forth, I mean, that is a separate question, and yet it isn't, right? I mean, because you don't need to do any of this fancy stuff with liminal and overlap and whatever to get these bubble pictures. All you need is to have an index into the text that this gives you the information that you need to, to draw that thing. Um, um, so um, in that respect, the bubbles really are, in a sense, a side effect. And yet, on the other hand, I know very well, as a you know, sometime teacher of literature myself, that that is going to be something that's you know, going to be, to some students at least, revelatory, if, you know, or if not that, then at least extremely interesting as a way of beginning to understand things that we as teachers and readers of literature become aware of and interested in, which go beyond simply, you know, s sitting in the armchair reading a good gothic, right? Um, you know, it, I mean, once you begin to learn what we learn as readers of literature, we learn that a good gothic is even better than you thought. Um, and um, um, one of the interests about this sort of interface is that it kind of gives you this you know, it sort of almost mainlines a certain aspect of this information and, you know, so you can directly see it and you don't need to go through the same kind of laborious process to begin to understand, for example, how the, the, the book is shaped by this relation among the narrations, right? Now that gets actually to the, to the second question, which is that, um, that, you know, it's a separate question, the, you know, bubble, I mean, to take this much further, I'm going to need a user interface specialist to help me, right? Um, um, but on the other hand, what you choose to represent does go back straight to the modeling question, right? Because I chose to mark up the structured narrative because I knew as a reader of Frankenstein that that was interesting. And if I had not known that, I might never have ended up with these particular bubbles because I would have had another set of bubbles that showed something else. Um, and so, you know, that's where we come back to this thing about the heuristic and the, you know, the way in which all of this cycles, right, the hermeneutic process involved. Because, because um, you know, partly what I'm interested in doing is to, um, is to actually um, do something which, you know, it's like a spin-off or side effect of my interest in working with the text is that other people can then share that interest and they can see, you know, there actually is something there. Right, and you know, I can pick up a, you know, do a, you know, a narrative poem and rhyme couplets, but they might go do, you know, they might do a completely different poetic form, and it might re look really different, and yet be also very, you know, uh, illuminating about that. Um, and so it's kind of that idea of having the toolkit. And I think that we've done tremendous things in the last 20 years to build these toolkits such that we now have an industry and a, you know, a culture growing up around us where people are, are doing this work and, and, and um, you know, being engaged and learning from it. Um, and at the same time, I also know that there's this sort of, you know, the, the bed of procrustes, right? I mean, you, the sort of way in which these Current, the technologies in the current form also really limit us. And so I'm interested in pushing that forward, pushing that out. And so what you're looking at with that is simply uh, an expression of that interest on my part. Which is a necessity 
And it also takes us back to this, uh, to this, to this, to this thing. Yeah, it's true. The complete, the complete computational stack needs trees in order to process because that's how we build computers. But that doesn't mean we uh, we can basically avoid dealing with NP-complete problems like overlapping tags and texts, right? Because um, you know you, you cannot go back looking at the elliptical um, uh, elliptical um, so, uh, elliptical ways how planets revolve around the sun simply because it's hard to compute, right? right. So you don't want to move the circle, because right. it's a short result, right? <laughs> Epicycles. <laughs>